Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, Mysterious Voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out-of-the-ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, it is Short Story Tuesday, a wonderful day to talk about all the short-form literature uh, that interests me. Uh, today, I want to talk about an interesting short story, one that has hit me particularly hard as I, as I read it, and even when I started thinking my, my thoughts about it. Uh, it is about a mother-daughter relationship. I am referring to I Stand Here Ironing by Tilly Olson, which was published sometime around 1961. For those who don't know, Tilly Olson was a writer who lived uh, in the 1900s. She died sometime around 2007. Uh, she was known for uh, being an activist as well as uh, for her writing. Uh, which you uh, you see in, in this short story, um, some, some activism here and there, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but um, as well as her other short stories where she talked about feminism and standing up for uh, those who had less, the, the, the working poor. Um, the, this, this story comes from her short story collection, Tell Me a Riddle. And I don't think she ever wrote anything longer than... Than, uh, than a short story, uh, at least that I can see. Um, I'll have to look a little bit deeper to see if I can find out more, because I would like to see like um, if she has written a novel, uh, because a novel that combines the themes found in I Stand Here Ironing, um, it, I think that would be very much worth reading. Yeah, there's there's not a whole lot of other information about uh, Tilly Olson, uh, just that her work is, is strongly regarded and some critics, like, they make sure to point out uh, her feminist leanings because if you don't consider that when uh, when an, an, analyzing her work, when, when thinking about her work, you're, you're really missing out on a, on a large scope of things. Uh, but I hadn't heard of this author before uh, before seeking out uh, some some of her work. So this is actually really interesting to me is that I, I found a, a new author that that seems to get a lot of the stuff that I, I love to read about. So without further ado, let's talk about I Stand Here Ironing. I will do a summary, a little bit of an analysis, and we will move on from there. So I Stand Here Ironing focuses on an unnamed mother talking about her oldest daughter, Emily, who is about 19 at the start of the story. It's told from like a, a sort of recounting perspective. I think she's being called by someone at a school or something asking about Emily's behavior and the mother is saying, how am I really supposed to know? I'll tell you about Emily, but there's her whole life outside of me uh, where I can't simply just give you all the information about her. Uh, the mother says that Emily's dad ran out on them uh, when she was less than a year old. Uh, and as a result, Emily's mom had to constantly work. At first, she worked days and had to leave Emily with a babysitter uh, who, who struggled with Emily because although the, Emily was a miracle baby with the mother, she wasn't necessarily that with the others. Emily also didn't enjoy the daycare that she went to. Uh, and eventually the mother started working nights, um, and but that was still difficult to be away from her daughter. And um, uh, it, it was very difficult to pay for babysitters and whatnot because she was so poor. Eventually she had to send Emily away to, um, to her dad's parents um, to raise her for a little bit because she couldn't afford to, but she was able to bring Emily back eventually. And uh, Emily is, is, is seen as shy and smiling and, and filled, filled with some joy uh, at, at various points in the story, with the mom noting that uh, she should have really um, incited this joy, like built upon it and, and furthered it by providing her daughter with opportunities, but she just didn't have the time. Uh, the mom was too busy with work and everything, trying to make a life for, for Emily. So when Emily was like, oh, can I stay home? Or, uh, mom, don't go to work. Uh, or like, don't go to the hospital or something like that because the mom was pregnant. Uh, she couldn't really do that for, for Emily. And as the mom starts having more children, things become a little uh, murky for Emily because it, although her, the mom still loves all the children, I think Emily senses that she doesn't have 
as much love for for one uh, reason or another. But the mom does note that like she does love all her children equally, and it, it, the unusual thing is that she is she's able to help the younger kids more because she's learning from her mistakes with Emily. Unfortunately, because Emily isn't eating or something like that, uh, the the clinic, the hospital. Uh, convinces the mom to send her to a convalescent home, which is a nursing home, which is a weird place to send a, a child at such a young age. Uh, and she is, they are able to get her to eat more and, and make her healthier, but she it, it doesn't really work out. And so they decide ultimately to send her back home in the loving arms of her mother, uh, where Emily uh, seems to develop few friendships. She does pursue a boy, but he... Um, the, the he gives his attention to someone else and she notes that she tried to attract his attention with candy and, and taking money from her mom's purse and she confesses that to her mother and i think the mom is filled more with pity than anything else uh but it's clear that emily doesn't really have a lot of friends uh she's faking si uh, being sick to stay home which is never a sign of good mental health um, and at, at first, like the mom lets her do it alone, stay home by herself alone on, on rare occasions. But she um, eventually she, she makes it so that her other daughter, Susan, stays home with Emily. And this seems to produce a negative relationship between Susan and Emily, which the mom calls poisonous um, in an effort to make things good for um, Emily results in um, something like um, a deteriorated relationship among the sisters. So the mom puts a stop to keeping Susan home too whenever Emily wants to stay home. Eventually, uh, there's a school talent show which uh, which the mom um, convinces Emily to participate in. And she does really well. She ends up winning it. And uh, she also... Um, she also... Uh, goes on a sort of tour of the of the surrounding area and performs at other places. So she seems to be doing pretty well there. Uh, but the mom does note that she has regrets in raising um, Emily as the story comes to a close. Uh, with the uh, with, with her noting that whatever caused the caller to call her today and ask about Emily hasn't shown up. But she does note that it might be there that this. This underlying mental health or, or troubled relationship is is leading to detrimental effects for Emily, and the story kind of ends on an ambiguous note, with the mother noting that Emily could be a late bloomer, but also uh, these traumatic events that she has gone through are bound to have produced something negative for Emily. So her future is uncertain as the story ends. In terms of analysis, there is just so much to talk about with this story. Um, I feel I'm not going to really be able to do it justice, especially because it's such a heavy, like, complex story. Uh, and it's not even that deep. It's just someone recounting the life of her daughter. And But it's and there's still so much there that you could analyze from a psychological perspective, a philosophical perspective, a sociological perspective. So I won't be able to touch upon everything. Again, I think this is one of those stories um, where you can analyze it line by line or paragraph by paragraph and really pull out a lot from this from this story. Like you could write entire papers of, about it for, uh, for whatever class that you might have. Uh, but one thing that I think Tilly Olson touches upon is a mother's regrets. Indeed, this entire story is one big confession about how you maybe didn't serve your daughter best, how you weren't the best mother for this particular daughter. Emily is the oldest, and the mom explains that she was less experienced, which is very familiar, a very familiar saying, because my mom would, would joke, and this is possibly a bad joke, that like, my older brother was the test child because she didn't exactly help him the best way. She was protective of him, but uh, she she was busy with work and whatnot, so she couldn't stop him from engaging in various shenanigans. And so I, I understand that sentiment, um, and knowing that the mother was was busy with work and and trying to um, trying to really make make things work for Emily because she couldn't always afford to have her there. Uh, and she always tried to save up money to make sure that Emily had what she needed. So there was an effort made, but uh, because of circumstances, because of how, uh, the time that she was in, um, you know, it can't be easy in the 1950s or 1960s. But because of that, because because of that time and that the, the circumstances, Emily wasn't given the resources she needed to really thrive in the best possible way. 
uh, which produced what appear to be negative mental health effects on Emily. You could argue that she's dealing with some sort of mental health trauma of the constantly changing environment because they do have to move on a constant basis. I do think the 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 uh, the, the diagnosis of childhood schizophrenia might be accurate here um, based on how she's um, reacting to a, a lot of what happens in the story. Like when her mother goes to the hospital, she throws the clock on the floor. She said the clock was being too loud. So hearing those auditory illusions or something like that uh, that could be a, a sign of childhood schizophrenia, but uh, I don't want to make a, an exact diagnosis there because I'm not, you know, uh, a, a trained psychologist in that in that way. But she has learned from her errors, um, as every mother does. You know, your first child, you you make a couple errors that you learn with the the second, third youngest child, and things seem to get better. Uh, allow me to read you a quote from this. The old man living in the back once said in his gentle way, you should smile at Emily more when you look at her. What was in my face when I looked at her? I loved her. There were all ac the acts of love. It was only with the others I remembered what he said, and it was the face of joy and not of care or tightness or worry I turned to them. Too late for Emily. She does not smile easily, let alone almost always as her brothers and sisters do. And that's a very interesting quote from this because uh, it shows like um, like someone maybe noticing the the troubled relationship they have and telling the mother you know how she can fix it but it's 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 maybe too late with Emily because you know 19 years have passed or so and it all the damage has been done but she's able to fix that mistake with her other ch children smile at her, not show a tightness, or um, appear to be agitated because of the, the circumstances that you're in, uh, which is pretty hard to do because, you know, you could be poor and like, it's hard to smile during those times. Another inter interesting thing worth discussing here is the feminist messaging. I don't think it can be forgotten in this story that Tilly Olson is a feminist, an activist uh, from the uh, from the 1950s and 60s and 70s, where which was a, a tumultuous time, and especially it changed our thinking on like how we can best help mothers and, and whatnot like that. Um, so. Uh, the, the mother in the story is a single mom trying to raise multiple kids. And that can't be can't be easy because, you know, uh, if you're doing it by yourself, uh, uh, which she is at times, like she has grandparents and whatnot who might be might be trying to help, but it's, it's really hard to do it on your own. Uh, there are so many expectations there of, of earning the money to help your, your kids thrive, but also being a doting mom, which is what society wants you to be, especially in the 1950s and 1960s. There's the idea of mother knows best, but does she? This is a new experience for the mother in this story. She had never had a child uh, uh, that uh, before. So Emily is her first child and she doesn't exactly know what works and what doesn't. So for anyone to expect her to know best is kind of you know, foolish. It's it's not that she doesn't want to be a good mother. It's just that she doesn't have the skills. And there's no, this might uh, go back to her own past where she probably didn't have the best mother or something like that. And times are constantly changing and the philosophy on motherhood is also changing. But we can't expect, you know, poor mothers to really um, to keep up with the, the best philosophies for how to raise your child. Um, there's other other factors at play too, um, which you typically see in feminist or feminist or social justice teachings. How there needs to be a safety net for um, mothers like the one in this story, where she uh, she had to give up her child multiple times in order to help her be healthy and eat uh, the food that she needed to eat. She sends her to a, a convalescent home, which is like a nursing home. Uh, so if she had, you know, affordable housing and uh, safety net programs like food stamps or SNAP um, or uh, just um, like uh, the ability to buy essentials and resources or even like, um, like, uh, heating and electricity and water uh, subsidies or something like that. That would greatly benefit the mother here and also uh, also as well like parenting classes, which, 
You probably didn't have as many in the 1950s or 60s, but you see all the time now. And so, uh, again, like the feminist messaging is that there needs to be all these other stuff in order for the mother to thrive. There's, uh, in terms of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there isn't that bottom thing yet. There needs to be something more in order to help this mother uh, allow Emily to have what she needs to grow up to be a healthy person. And the mother wants more for Emily. She and not in just in terms of having the food or, or the resources she needs to grow. It's also in terms of wanting her more than to just be at this ironing board. Because the, the mother is taking the call at the ironing board um, at the start of the story. And it sounds like the mom doesn't just want to do that. She doesn't just want to be seen as a mother. She wants other things for herself as for as for the children. And I think that's the, the idea of the story is her, the mom doesn't want to see Emily like just become another mom. She wants to, to like uh, fuel her talents and allow her to succeed and have the life that she wants. And which is, which is probably more than the life that, that what society wants for Emily. The last thing worth noting in the story we're talking about is the question, is there hope for Emily? Is, is the, are the past 19 years going to catch up for, with Emily and make her worse off in terms of her personal growth, but also in terms of uh, friends and relationships down the road? Is there hope that she's going to have a better life? than what she had growing up. You could argue yes, because the mother has been so caring and has constantly pushed Emily in a better direction. Maybe that's the case, like we can overcome our environment uh, in that way. And Emily could, uh, could fully bloom and, and shine in, in that regard. Uh, but there's also the unfortunate implication that those who come from like poor backgrounds are only ever able to be poor. Like there's no uh, lifting yourself up by your bootstraps in, in most cases. And so Emily is going to continue this this unfortunate lifestyle. Like she's going to marry someone and have a kid of her own. And maybe that that father might leave uh, too. And Emily's going to just go through a cycle that her own mom went. And it's going to be generation after generation of mothers who are accidentally failing their daughter because they don't have the, the proper resources. Not even to mention the mental health that is in our mind right now, like the mental illnesses that might be developing, such as depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or what, whatnot, that were developed as a result of, of this upbringing, which might not have been intentional on the mother's parts, but circumstances and societal factors uh, combined to make things, uh, you know, not look good in, in that regard. So I, I want to be hopeful for Emily, but ultimately I think, and the mother probably guesses that it's not going to, it's not going to end well for Emily, or she's not going to have the successful life that her mom wants her to have. Anyway, on that sad note, uh, that was I Stand Here Ironing by Tilly Olson, a really sad but very fascinating short story. One that I find similar to Everyday Use by Alice Walker uh, about examining uh, family relationships and how you might have failed a daughter or um, how you might wish for a better relationship uh, or uh, better opportunities when, you were, when they were growing up. Um, it's, it's definitely one we're checking out. I'm going to link to it in the comment or in the description below. I hope you read it. Like if I, if you read any one that I've, that I've talked about recently, any short story, I hope it's, I stand here ironing because it really has a kick. Uh, and it's one that I'm going to probably find it hard to forget about for quite some time. Uh, if you read it before, some, uh, you know, comment below. Let me know what you think. Let's have a discussion about this short story. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that other people can find out about Tilly Olson if they don't already know about her. And I stand here ironing uh, because it's a short story worth reading. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and parental travels. Farewell.